Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan, operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Lansing Branch was established in 1973. The Dean is Dr. Terry Walsh, and the Vice President is Dr. Tandy Tripp. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted with God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, 
took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we will have a prayer by Sister Kimberly Woodworth. Our scripture for today is Amos, the third chapter, to be read by Dr. Edward Bowman. 
I will be doing the announcements at the end of class. We will have a couple selections from the choir. And our readers for today is our public relations officer, Dr. Roger Gentry, and our secretary, Dr. Janice Welsh, and our alternate is Sister Mariah Lewis. Thank you, let us pray our, bow our hearts and minds today and praise Yashua for this beautiful day and our teaching here that we have is a wonderful and beautiful thing. And with that I say hallelujah. Good afternoon. I'll be uh, reading the scripture today. Uh, Amos, the third chapter. Amos 3, and I'll be reading from uh, King James Version and inserting the proper names as necessary. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den, if ye have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth, where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth, and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and Yahweh hath not done it? Surely Yahweh Elohim will do nothing, but he revealeth it to his secret, his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? Yahweh Elohim hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Publish in the palaces at Ashdod, in the palaces in the land of Egypt, and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria, and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof, in the oppressed in the midst thereof. For they, for they know not to do right, saith Yahweh, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore thus saith Yahweh Elohim, an adversary shall be even round about the land, and shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palace, palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith Yahweh, as the shepherd taketh out the mouth of the lion, two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, in and in Damascus in a couch. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith Yahweh Elohim, Elohim of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith Yahweh. Amos, the third chapter. Good morning, class. I would like to remind everyone at this time to please quiet also.
my Messiah mine. Lift me to the holy place, my Messiah mine. Shine thy light upon my face. Lift the darkness from my eyes. Let me see. Satan lies. Let me know the joy of life known only through you, my Messiah mine. How I long to be your bride, my Messiah mine. Through you there's eternal. Let me learn of you all I can. Guide me with your gentle hand. Let me know that I am always loved by you. Let me drink your living waters. Let me sacrifice the blood. Immerse me. In your spirit, Yahshua. Oh, let me drink your living waters. Let me sacrifice the blood. Immerse me in your spirit, Yahshua. fruition that's a type of resurrection 
When you turn off the light and go to sleep at night, bury your head beneath the covers. Arise in the morning, oh, that's just another type of resurrection. So I know that it lives, my Redeemer lives. I know. Tell me, do you? Yes, I know that he lives, my Redeemer lives, I know, he gave me all the proof. Yes, I know that he lives, my Redeemer lives, this I know, how about you, how about you? Israel ate that lamb, then left Egypt's land, to the Red Sea, old Pharaoh right behind them. Through divided waters, Yah delivered them on dry land. That's a type of resurrection Old Joseph was a dreamer His brothers did despise They put him in that hole For they sought to take his life Then he was lifted up By the merchants passing by That's a type of resurrection So I know that he lives My Redeemer lives This I know Tell me do you Yes I know that he lives My Redeemer lives Oh he lives gave me all the proof yes i know that he lives my redeemer lives this i know how about you how about you abraham was faithful took his son to sacrifice then yahweh said you please me you don't have to take his life then he turned around to see the ram yah did provide that's a type of resurrection Yes, 
I know that he lives My redeemer lives Oh, he lives He gave me all the proof Yes, I know that he lives My redeemer lives This I know How about you? How about you? Abraham was faithful Took his son to sacrifice Then Yahweh said you please me He don't have to take his life Then he turned around to see the ram Yah did provide That's a type of resurrection Oh, a type of resurrection Oh, 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 oh. Now all these types and shadows Truly testify that Yahshua has risen, that Holy Spirit that gives life. I don't have to sit and wonder if he is alive. Because he said, I am the resurrection. I am the So I know that he lives, my Redeemer lives. I know, do you know? Yes, I know that he lives, my Redeemer lives. I know, do you know? Thank you, choir. Well, our first speaker for today will be Sister Mariah Lewis. Good morning. Good morning. Um, happy to be here today. Good. And Yahshua, well, we, Yahweh came down to Yahweh Elohim, and then he came down in a physical body as Yahshua the Messiah. And he died, buried, and resurrected for the love of us and for our, our sins. And the tabernacle pattern goes according to Yahshua with the death, burial, and then the resurrection. And from the, if you go to the gate, up to the second veil is 1,200 inches. And then when you come back down, it's like Yahweh coming down and dying for us. Because Yahshua is the intercessor. He's the light and he's the bread of the world and he's the door. And he came to into his ministry at the age of 30. And here at the um, altar of sin sacrifice, it's seven and a half feet on each side. And if you come into the center of the altar, it is three and three fourths. Um, feet and from um, Yahshua's ministry he died at three and three-fourths like his age was 33 and three-fourths and that shows Yahweh coming down and dying for us on the um, on the altar or like on the cross. And I looked up where um, 
Israel's longitude and latitude, and I found out that it was near, it was about 33 east and 33 north. Hmm. I mean, not exactly, but close. close, very close. It was about like 31 east and 35 north to be like exact, but it was, it still shows that everything's going according to and pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. And with that, I'd like to say hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Lewis. Our next speaker for today will be the secretary of our school, Dr. Janice Welsh. Good morning, class. Um, can we get Exodus 25 and 8? Um, <clears throat> what we've been going through is some information about this tabernacle pattern. Now, the moderation, in the moderation, it says absolutely nothing. That means absolutely. There's no thing that does not, uh, there's nothing that escapes this tabernacle. So you can go out as far as you want to go. You're going to see a manifestation of this tabernacle, and you can go as deep as you want to go, and you're still going to see something about this tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> this tabernacle didn't just come out, come about haphazard. You know, it didn't just poof. Um, some people decided that they were going to make a tabernacle one day. And as it's been stated, there's only, there's about 50 chapters in the Bible devoted to this tabernacle pattern. So it is very important. Now, let's get Exodus 25 and 8. Exodus 25 and 8. Mm -hmm. And let them make me a sanctuary. Now let them, that's the children of Israel out here in the wilderness of Sinai. He said, let them make me a sanctuary. Read that I may dwell among them. That Yahshua or the Holy Spirit could dwell among them. Read. According to all that I show thee. Now this pattern had to be according to all that I show thee. Who did he show? He showed Moses. He showed Moses, he gave him a vision here in the mountain. And he said, make it exactly like I showed you in the mountain. Don't deviate, read. After the pattern of the tabernacle, mm -hmm and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, mm -hmm. even so shall ye make it. Even so shall ye make it. Now, when we were going through our session, we were wondering, um, <clears throat> we were talking about how Yahshua was 33 and, a th and three fourths years old when he was crucified. And that showed very clearly in this, with this altar. And we were wondering, we were like, okay, we're talking about the lines that are in the tabernacle, which if you look, <clears throat> you've got lines going across and you've got lines going up and down. So we thought, well, what about the longitude and the latitude? So um, <clears throat> Mariah looked it up for Israel, the country where he walked, or Jerusalem really is where they crucified him. I think it was Jerusalem. Actually, they took him outside of the city. So we had her look up the longitude and the latitude line and see what, what it would come up with. And it was about 33 in either direction. So even when Yahweh set up his purpose and plan, he had already planned where he was going to be crucified. And that in his crucifixion, it would line up with the um, latitude, longitude and latitude lines on the earth. Now, how tight is that? That is just amazing, at least to me, that um, 
you know, you just think, oh, well, let's just see. And it lines up. So the tabernacle <clears throat> was, was given to Moses here in this mount. Now let's go over and get, I think, Exodus 40. And it talks about when Yahweh um, is towards the end of the chapter where he filled that tabernacle pattern. <clears throat> now, when they, when Moses, so the, the tabernacle didn't just poof out of nowhere. Moses was given a vision here on Mount Sinai and he was instructed exactly how he was to make that tabernacle. And Yahweh gave him those instructions and Moses came down, back down out of the mount. And he still didn't leave it up to the people to go ahead and say, well, you know what? I got a better idea of how to build this tabernacle. Yahweh put his spirit in those men who were going to build it. I don't remember their names. What was it? Bezi, Beza, Bezalel. Bezalel. Oh, Holiab. Oh, Holiab. <laughs> but he put his spirit in them so that they would not err in the way that they were going to make that tabernacle. So he never left it up to a man to do any of it at all. Okay, read. Exodus 40 and... 34. Exodus 40 and 34, okay? When then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Now, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Read. And the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. And the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. And folks, that's the same thing that happens with you. So if you don't believe what happened back here with the children of Israel, look at your own self. You were made by this tabernacle pattern. And when you were born, even before you were born, Yahweh didn't consult or ha you didn't have to consult with people. Say, okay, now uh, let's see. <clears throat> the sperm enters in over here. And uh, instead of dividing in half, I want you to divide four times faster. I w There's no anything on the outside telling that egg to multiply or how to basically it starts growing and growing and growing. And then once that child is born and there's a series of things that a mother has to go through before a baby can be born, you can't just go from zero to nine months and have a baby. There's a lot of things that happen um, right in her uh, chest area. The breast change. They start to, the nipples become dark and, you know, all kinds of lumps and bumps. And you're like, what is going on? And they start, sometimes they're tender, sometimes they're sore. Your body is preparing itself to deliver a child. And it's not really an easy task. <laughs> Some women say they have a breeze in having a baby. They're few and far between. So once that starts to happen and, you're, and you're, your hips, you know, women are made different than men if you haven't noticed. Um, our, our hips are, are wide. Men's hips are narrow. And the reason for that is because it has to carry that child in kind of like a bowl. <laughs> it's kind of like a bowl thing. If you look at it here, you see how this hip structure, and this kind of looks like the hip of a man to me. But um, the bones begin to soften. And so that once delivery takes place, there's enough room for that baby to come out of that, um, out of those, those bones that kind of, <laughs> some people say, it rolled back. No, it doesn't roll back. Uh, the bones kind of soften to let that child come through. So they don't hit a brick wall because if the baby is trying to come through and you're at your normal, if your bone structure was normally the way it was, it would have a hard time coming out. So Yahweh instructed Moses to build this tabernacle exactly like he saw it up in the, in the mount. Now, why did he have to build it exactly like he saw it up in the mount? This wasn't just some little structure. This was showing um, 
people how Yahweh Elohim is the archetype or the original pattern. This is the tabernacle pattern of Yahweh. So when Moses saw it up here, it was intangible. You couldn't touch it, you couldn't feel it, you couldn't taste it. But he was told and it was here in his mind and he had to come down here and build this structure. Not Moses, Yahweh put the spirit in those men to have them build it exactly like he saw it here in that mountain. Now there's a lot of things about this tabernacle that are just phenomenal because it just seems like a little structure uh, made of hair, skin, linen, gold, whatever. But when you start digging into what's going on here with this tabernacle, as the first speaker was talking about, this altar is showing you something about Yahshua the Messiah and how he is going to come in and be sacrificed for our sins. So you had the they had to kill the, the, the animal or the sacrifice and put it on the four, put the blood on the four horns of this altar. And they had to pour the blood around the outside of that altar, showing you how Yahshua was going to come in and his blood was going to be spilled on the ground. And it had to be that way. Because there's a scripture that says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So nobody can be saved until that sacrifice, the true sacrifice, is killed. Now, we talked about the four angles. Now, when I was in school, they talked about, I think it was is it geometry, those angles and all those degrees and stuff, and it had my head spinning. It's like, oh my goodness, why do we have to take geometry? It didn't make any sense to me. But when you take that same thing that you learned in school, geometry, you have four right angles right here. And why do you have four right angles? When you have a square, it means that it's the same length on each side. So this altar was seven and a half feet this way, this way, this way, and this way. And when those corners come together, they kind of look like this, which forms what they call right angles. And Yahshua certainly had the right angle when he came to, to die for our sins. Now, there's also degrees, they call them. And when they come together like this, it's a 90 degree angle. And when you have four of those 90 degree angles, it makes a complete circle. So you will have like, this is a 90 degree angle. This is a 180 degree angle. And when you take it on around here, what is that? Three times, 270 and then 360. And when you, ha we used to have these little things in uh, school. I never did really learn how to use them, but you would put it here protractor and put it on the point and then you would circle it all the way around and it would make a circle or it would make the degrees for you so you could you could see how to make a you know a degree so here you have 360 degrees just from the angles on here and that correlates with the earth which is circular so that's a 360 degree um, ain't, what do you call it? Six, 360 degrees makes a circle, a complete circle. So Yahu, or Yahshua made a complete circle. He completed everything. Nothing was left out when he um, was, um, when this tabernacle was set up to show how he would come in and that he would die for our sins. Now, the other thing about this was that you go in to the center, and that's where the sacrifice was placed, in the center of the altar. And in the center of that altar was three and three-fourths, is it inches? Feet. Three and three-fourths feet. The wood was placed down first, and the altar, or the sacrifice, was placed on the wood. And that just goes to show you how Yahshua was going to come in, they were going to put that cross down 
the on the earth and the earth is like an altar and there's fire in the earth in the center of the earth there's always some um what they call it molten of uh, core mantle the core is where there's continual burning inside the earth and with this altar that yahweh had them make after they made it he didn't have them light it he lit right. the fire and if somebody knows where that is, um, you can get it and let the readers know. Because these things are in the scriptures about how Yahweh set this tabernacle pattern up. And it was to show forth him. He's that, um, that, all, that sacrifice. But that fire, even the fire, was not even allowed by, for the man to um, light. Yahweh lit that fire. And you know what? And when this child is born into the world, it's not any man that lights that child up. That child has to take on the, on the, takes in the oxygen. That child goes from blue to red in color because of the oxygen that enters into the child. So unless he takes in or that life is sparked, he will stay blue. He will not turn to the red. He will not be alive but it is not the man. I mean, sometimes they can pump oxygen into a baby all day and all night, and that baby will not live. It's that spirit of Yahweh that gets into that child that causes him to live, that lights his fire, just like this fire was lit down here at the altar. Did you find that? If not, that's okay. So you have that going with this altar, <clears throat> and it's all pointing to Yahshua the Messiah. And you know what? If you don't believe the Bible, can you believe the own, your own body that you live in? Because Yahweh had it set up so that right within your um, physical body is a witness that he was going to be the sacrifice. And why do you know that? Because when you eat, first of all, you eat food. You have to chew it. you got to break it down. And that's just the start, because a lot of times when people eat, they don't even chew their food up good. That causes for poor digestion. So you have to start chewing the food, and, you, and it gets broken down. And it's just so amazing to me how digestion correlates here with this migratory pattern. How the children of Israel were here up in Canaan's land. And they had to go down into bondage into the land of Egypt. And right within your own physical body, when you eat, you chew that food, it goes down into bondage into the stomach. And I'm telling you, this food gets the acid treatment. It's called hydrochloric acid. And that breaks the food down even more. Hydrochloric acid is so strong that if you put, put some on your skin, it will burn your skin off. Now, you remember the children of Israel were led by this cloud. And in your in stomach, you have what they call a mucus lining so that the hydrochloric acid can go in there, break down that food, but it will not burn up your stomach. That mucus is like a cloud and it protects the stomach or the fleshy part from getting eaten up or burned up. Now, once the food is in there, it's in there for about what, three to four hours, something like that. The children of Israel were, were they didn't come out until like the 4,000th year. So in correlation, three, four, about four, four I'm sorry, 400 years. They weren't down there 4,000. So <laughs> when the um, food is churned or broken down here in the stomach, then you got this little thing here. It's called the duodenum, and it means 12. So before it goes into the small intestines, it goes into this thing called the duodenum, which means 12. So the children of Israel were down here in Egypt, and there were 12 tribes or 12 sons from Jacob that came out of this land of Egypt. So you have the food being in bondage, and then it is released. Now, the food doesn't just all of a sudden decide, oh, it's time for me to go to the next step. No. All of it is still controlled by the cloud or the brain. 
it lets out a signal or sends a signal down for this food to be released in the small intestines. The other cool thing that I like about this when you compare your physical body with what's going on um, in the, not, not only in the tabernacle pattern, but this is also a pattern. This is a migratory pattern. This shows the function of the tabernacle. It's a tabernacle pattern in motion. This is the structure of the tabernacle pattern. So this tells you, um, you know, all the, the vessels and everything that's in it. Just like your physical body, what does it have? It has a function and it has structure, structure and function. You can see in the anatomy books how you have the structure, your body is built a certain way, but it functions also. So when you look up here in the brain, it tells this food when it needs to go to the next step. Now, when um, <clears throat> it gets into the small intestines, you look at the small intestines and it just looks like a, just a little hot mess, right? Just, they're all going any kind of old way. But when you compare it over here to the children of Israel, it says they were wandering in the wilderness of Sinai, but they were not wandering. They were being led by the cloud. Now that's shown with your food inside your small intestines. They call it a bolus of food, which is just a little small portion. The food doesn't just rush through the, the small intestines because it takes time to extract the nutrients out. And you got little things called, um, is it villi? Villi, I figured you, you know what that was. And that's when people are lactose intolerant or something, their villi don't work. And it helps to push the food along. But when it gets that signal from the brain, this part of it opens up to kind of squeeze that food through the intestines. And then this side over here closes. So it's being like kind of pushed through or kind of squeezed through like a <laughs> sausage. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of saying how you, they stuff sausage in there. And uh, so it's moving along at a pace that is dictated by this cloud because you get a signal from the brain. Okay, food, it's time for this. Is it a polaric valve or? Pi, pi, pyloric, like sweet potato pyloric. Anyway, pyloric <laughs> valve, and it's open this end, it closes this, and it just moves it along. So the children of Israel are being moved along. So when this cloud dictates, the cloud would get up, and they'd see the cloud, and the children of Israel would be like, uh-oh, we got to pack up and follow this cloud. And that's what they did. They all had their own little functions that they had to do to break this tabernacle down and follow that cloud. But they did not move unless this cloud dictated. Your food doesn't move through your intestines until your brain dictates or sends that signal down for it to move. Now, once the food gets through the small intestines, it goes over here into the large intestines. The large intestines is the... Um, what is this? Colon. Colon, what is it called? Ascending, ascending. yeah, because it's going, it's ascending, it's pretty easy to remember. It's ascending because it's going up. Transverse is because it's going across. Descending is because it's going down. And then you just have to remember sigmoid. That don't make no sense to me. S G. S. Oh, it's S-shaped. So you have your four parts to your colon there. Now, it's not so much the colon, but it's those arteries. There's groups of arteries, and they're in four places on your intestines to help with this whole digestion process. But by then, you know, you're coming to the end of digestion. And you know what? This food, um, the food that comes through, or what, this is the waste by this time, your intestines act as a dehydrator to extract the water from the food so that when it comes out, it's solid. And it also, it sanitizes the um, um, fecal material. You know, it's interesting too, speaking of that, they had a big old um, spill on the highway. 
And I thought, oh boy, everybody about to get sick now. But what they said they had done was they sanitized it with lime first so that it killed all the germs or the bacteria in it. So within your body, that's what happens with the fecal. It is sanitized because I can't even imagine if it wasn't, there's so much bacteria and stuff, it would probably, you know, overwhelm the physical body. Um, human waste from a truck. It was on one, I-127. But they got it all cleaned up. They brought their little trucks and scooped it up and washed it up. <laughs> it was on the news. Avoid the area because human waste were on the highway. And that's unusual. You never, hmm? Yeah, it was treated. So it was supposedly okay. But your fecal material is treated inside your body too. It's sanitized. Now, so that's four points of blood on this, um, on the, on the uh, intestines, just like they had to put the four points of blood down here on the land, um, on the door in the land of Egypt in order for them to be, um, what do you call it? Delivered from the, from the Egyptians. So there's a lot of things in this tabernacle pattern and you can verify it by looking at your physical body. Now, did you get that scripture? Can you tell me what it is? Leviticus what? Leviticus 9, 23, and 24. And go ahead and read it, and I'll repeat it. That's okay. Go ahead and read it, and I'll repeat it here. <clears throat> and Moses and Aaron, they went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of Yahweh appeared unto all the people, 24, and there came a fire out from before Yahweh and consumed upon the altar of the burnt offering and the, and the fat, fat and the fat which when all the people saw, mm -hmm. they shouted. They shouted. And fell on their faces. And fell on their faces. So Yahweh lit this altar of incense. Right, right. Nobody else. They didn't have a bick. They didn't have no matches. None of that. Right. Yahweh himself lit this fire. Just like when you're born into this world, Yahweh lights your fire. And it's through right. his spirit that we are even alive because Yahweh's name means he who exists and he who causes to exist. So there's no other person on this earth that can cause anything to exist except that it be Yahweh. And um, with those words, I'll say hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. Our next speaker for today will be Dr. Edward Bowman. Good afternoon, class. It's a pleasure to be here again. Another opportunity. So, and it's about redeeming the time. So that's all we got to, is to redeem the time and and to, you know, uh, proclaim this vision, and which was given to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in 1931. And it's not just a, a vision from a man, but from Yahweh. Yahweh gave him this vision. 
and it's shown on all these these charts and this is the same vision that Yahweh showed Moses and he also showed John and so this is a panoramic vision and this is how we learn because this is the same thing in the Bible these are the the pictures to go along with the words in the Bible because everything in the scripture was visions that Yahweh gave the prophets. And so you see the words in the Bible, but you have the pictures that go along with the words. And so we're able to understand it better, and we also have the tabernacle to go along with that because everything, as was mentioned earlier, everything goes according to this pattern, this tabernacle. And we have, you know, our body is also a physical representation of, of this, this pattern. This pattern was revealed to Moses in the Mount, and that's why he was told to make everything according to that pattern, because that's what we have to match everything up by. We have to, you know, just like the plates, you know, we match up the tabernacle along these plates and see how they compare and how they line up. And that's why there's principles in this, in this tabernacle, witnesses. So that way we can know something about, you know, Yahweh Elohim and about the unity of the Spirit and about how the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Word are one. We have those witnesses to prove that. And that's what we're down here it is, is to prove this to our own satisfaction to prove it, you know, not just because I said it or Terry said it or Janice said it. It's about proving it to yourself. So that way your faith is your own faith and not somebody else's faith. You know, you can't live on, you know, just like the five wise and the five foolish virgins. You know, the foolish ones, virgins, wanted to buy the oil from the wise virgins. And they, they barely had enough oil for themselves, you know. But we need our own oil, which is our own, that comes from our own investigation, our own study. You know, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we rightly, we're rightly dividing. That's what we're coming down here. We're rightly dividing. And that's what Yahweh, he he come down, he broke himself down, so that way we can understand it. Is this not, you know, it's, it's dividing? It's a unity, but it's, it's broken down, so that way we can understand it. And so that way we may be approved, you know, and that approval is going to sh show in the manifestation of our life, is our very, very life is going to manifest that. And uh, earlier we were talking about uh, the 2300 days, and can you get Daniel 8 and 14? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Daniel 8 and 14. And he said unto me, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay. So Daniel is talking about after the 2,300 days that that's, that's going to be the time that the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. And so that was something that was being foretold by Daniel that something that was going to take place. And so... We know that that took place in Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection. And so we can actually see it on multiple places on the chart where Yahshua's death, you know, like a day is equal to a thousand years, a thousand years is equal to a day. So that first day is, is like uh, a thousand. Uh, the second day, Saturday, is two thousand. The third day is on Sunday, the 300th part of the day. So 
but we also call this the ph phenomenal day. It, even though it wasn't, you know, uh, three 24-hour days, but with Yahweh, from darkness to light, the light to darkness, that's what he calls, you know, day. And so, at his death, it turned dark. It turned dark there at his death. And then, uh, what's that? And then, and then, it, and then light, and uh, and then uh, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it it got it got dark, and then light, and then light and dark, and so even on Sunday, you know, that was the three hundredth part of the day. That was at the beginning where the sun was rising, you know, and it also shows right here. Yeah or crack of dawn. Crack of dawn. Yep. And so we see that light, you know, arising. And that's showing forth Yahshua the Messiah, like how he rises within us through the Holy Spirit. And so we see that, we see the 2300 uh, days fulfilled on this chart, but it also shows in multiple places on the chart. It shows it right here, the thousand you know, the 2,000 and the 300th part of the day here. And so that's showing forth the 23, you know, 100 days. But also, too, is something happens, you know, after the 2,300 days, something that's to happen. And we refer back to the tabernacle to be able to understand this. Do you want to get uh, Zechariah 3 and read, I think, to the fourth or fifth verse? Zechariah 3 and 4. Zechariah from the third chapter, first, first three, verse three to, the, to like the fourth or fifth. Okay, Zechariah 3 and 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahweh. And Satan standing at his right hand. <coughs> and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Yahweh rebuke thee, O Satan. Even Yahweh that have chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Okay, so we're seeing that, you know, Joshua, which was Yahshua, because there was no letter J, so his name was Yahshua. And he was basically, you know, standing in the gap. He was an intercessor or a mediator for Jerusalem. And so because of Jerusalem's sin and their condition, he was actually, you know, uh, interceding for Jerusalem. So go ahead. Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Okay, so Joshua was, was clothed in, in filthy garments, and uh, it says that he was going to get a change of uh, raiment. Well, if you go in the, in, the, in the tabernacle, you know, when, they're, when the priest is here in the tabernacle sacrificing, you know, they have a different clothing th than they would up here. And so a lot of times we don't think about the change that takes place. You know, there's actually a change of raiments that takes place from here versus here. And then a change of raiment right here where, he, where the priest goes into the most holy once a year for the day of atonement. So there's actually three different, you know, uh, uh, garments that the priest wears on different different occasions and so Yahshua you know at his death burial resurrection you know fulfilling the 2300 days there's going to be a change of of raiment because the body that Yahshua 
you know, was a body that everything, all of the sin of Adam, of everything, of mankind, was all put on Yahshua. And even in, uh, I think it's Isaiah 53, it, it talks about that he was smitten of Yahweh, you know, and all the sins were laid upon him. And so there was a change of raiment, just like the priests did. There was a change of raiment that Yahshua, when, when, his, when his death, burial, resurrection, that was a, like a raiment. His body, when he walked on the earth, that was a, in a type of a, like a raiment. Then at his, his death, it says they wrapped him in, you know, in fine linen or clean linen. And so that is like another raiment. And then at the resurrection, you know, when he was seen on the earth plane for 40 days, that was another raiment. That's, a, you know, a, uh, a spiritual body. So you see three, three types of uh, garments that Yahshua was, was wearing, you know, not physically, but we're talking about something that's, you know, that's spiritual, but we're referring to natural to understand the spiritual. And so there are three different types of raiments, just like the, like the priest here. And so that raiment that, that we have of the sin of Adam, you know, the curse, the sin of Adam, you know, Yahshua the Messiah gave us a change of raiment. And that change of raiment helps us to be able to stand in the holy place. But, and that's where we're standing in the holy place until we re receive the, the glorified body, you know, because it talks about that we know not what shall appear, but how does that go? Uh, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. Okay, yeah. So we will appear as he is at the, at the, the final judgment. When everything is, you know, uh, our body falls off, death is totally, that's the last enemy that's put underneath the feet, is death is, is conquered. And then we have that spiritual body, you know, that brings us from, from here to the most holy place. And it's also manifested, you know, on the, the ages and dispensations. And so right now, uh, we're in this age, we're in the fourth age, and we're going forth over into the sixth, and, and then later on it'll be the seventh age. And so that's a change that's going to take place from, from the holy place that we're standing in to the most holy place is, is being in Yahshua the Messiah. And so... They're showing forth a, a change of raiment. You can, you can even show forth that was the raiment that we were wearing in, in the third age or in the law. And then Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection gave, gave us you know, a, a change of raiment to be able to stand in the holy place. And then there was going to be another change of raiment, which were received that glorified immortal body. And so, you got a question? What is remnant? You keep saying that word, and I don't know what it means. What's that? Raiment, yeah. Raiment is uh, something that you wear or a garment. And so, and a garment is actually represented, too, with the veils. You know, even at Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection, it, when he, he died, it says that the, the veil was rent. And so, when the veil's rent, that shows access. You know, Hebrews 10, and uh, I think it's it, in 10, get Hebrews 10, it talks about boldness being going through. We have boldness to go into the holy place by the blood of Yahshua the Messiah. Hebrews 10 and 19. And 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yahshua, 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay, so now we have, because of Yahshua the Messiah, we have boldness to enter into uh, beyond that veil, because he rent that veil, so now we, there's access, you know, through his blood. You know, now we can go boldly, where, where before there was always like a, you know, a, a remembrance of, there was always a remembrance of sin, because those, those sacrifices in the law would only cover them up, you know, but they didn't really atone for them, or they couldn't renew your, your mind as far as memory, and, and it, all it did is just covered it up. But Yahshua made a way that actually uh, made us righteous in, you know, according to the Father, because the Father, when he seen his son, you know, he seen that he was smitten by Yahweh. He was, that was a state that Yahweh seen us, you know, uh, in, the, in the law. You know, but now we're not seen that way. Now we're seen if we're in Yahshua and Messiah, he sees us as his son. And so those veils are, are important because that's showing there's a change. There's always a change when there's a renting of, of the veil. And so that was the, the 2300, uh, you know, shows that. And we were trying to figure out... Uh, which part of the 23 are we talking about? Are we talking about from the gate to here, the 23, or from, from the altar to here, or from here to the door? But the 2300 days that we're talking about is from when Yahshua began his ministry and when he fulfilled it and brought us right here to the door. That's the 2300 days that we're, we're talking about right here. And... I was seeing something earlier, and I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, well, if you if you take the, you know the the 23 feet from the altar to the 23 from the the laver, you have the principle of 46. Well, you have the four and the six that equals the 10, and so this is something. There's always witnesses to show something else, and so what that was showing was. Yahshua was picking up not only where Adam, you know, left off, but he was also picking where, where the children of Israel, when the Ten Commandments came down, you know, they said, everything that you said, we'd be obedient. Well, they weren't. Well, Yahshua was obedient. It says that he was obedient unto death. And he also said when he was praying to the Father, you know, you know, everything that you uh, given me, I've been obedient. Everything that, every soul, every person, he didn't lose any of them, you know. So that's showing forth that principle of the number 10, you know, with the 46, is showing forth that he's picking up where the children of Israel and bringing us to be that new Israel by faith. We are that new Israel, not by blood, but we were grafted in, and by faith, we're that new Israel, which is that bride, that new Jerusalem. And with that, I say hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Our next speaker for today will be the dean, or I'm sorry, the president of our school, Dr. David Underwood. And good morning. And afternoon and good day. Covered everything, didn't we? Can we hear? Yeah. Okay. Too well. Too well, huh? 
All right. Okay, um, this morning we've covered some of the 2,300 days that um, was in the prophecy of, of, of Daniel. And it simply boils down to Yahshua's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And as a previous speaker said, the death on Friday is a thousand. His burial is two thousand. And then his resurrection is the three hundredth part of the day. So we have one, two, and the three hundredth part makes it twenty three hundred. And the previous speaker said, well, this also in other charts. So here's the death, here's the burial, here's the resurrection, and you'll read Friday a thousand, Saturday two thousand, and then Sunday the three hundredth part of the day. And then also, we know we can find that on this chart as well, which is Friday a thousand, the death, the burial, Saturday two thousand and then the resurrection Sunday, 300 part of the day. And also back on plate 31 of our 40 plate chart is also there as well. Now, when we read Daniel, the 8 and 14, if you would read that again. Start at 13 and come down, please. Yes. Try it out of the holy name and not the, I mean out of the King James, not the holy name. Daniel 8 and 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the... Now, first of all, let's say this. There aren't saints, they're sons. Or in this case, they're angels. All right? So they're not saints. It's not St. Matthew... It ain't St. Mark, it ain't St. Luke, it ain't St. John, it's not St. Barnabas, it ain't St. It's not St. They're sons. And we hope that we have one calling to be called a son. All right? Now, if you want saints, go to the Roman Catholic Church because they got thousands of saints if you want saints. All right? So remember, Daniel's out here in Babylon when he was taken captive by the Babylonians. And this is where he's beginning to have this vision that we're reading about here in the 8th chapter. So please again. Daniel 8 and 13. Then I heard one saint speaking. And another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? Now, we know from the previous speakers, then once Yahweh had Moses construct this tabernacle and established the priesthood with his brother Aaron and Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, that there were daily sacrifices that were offered up within this tabernacle. Daily. Yep. Daily sacrifices. Continue. And the transgression of desolation. Now, we know that we have a transgression, right? Continue. To give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Now, the sanctuary, as we come to learn, is the most holy place and the holy place. Or as you can see here, the most holy place and the holy place, that is the sanctuary. Continue. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, a good carnal mind would say 
Well, it has to be a physical, carnal sanctuary that has to be cleansed. Because we know that when the high priest, on the Day of Atonement, he had to go into the most holy place three times. Once was for the sins of himself. The second time was for the sins of the people. Well, if all that sin's around, then this tabernacle needs to be cleansed. Or they had in a greater scale the temple. The high priest had to go in for his sins, the sins for the children of Israel, and for the cleansing of the temple. Now, let's understand that this physical tabernacle was a type, it was a shadow, it was an allegory of the physical body of Yahshua the Messiah. And we must also understand that this temple was a more glorious structure than this physical tabernacle that was out here in the wilderness of Sinai, of which eventually the children of Israel took through the divided waters of the Red Sea and set up on Mount Zion. And when the time came, once this tabernacle or temple was built, then what takes place is the vessels of importance that were of gold were moved in to the temple. And again, this temple here is a type, it's a shadow, it's an allegory of the spiritual body of Yahshua the Messiah. That has to be understood. The tabernacle was a type and shadow of his physical body. The temple was a type and shadow of his spiritual body or spiritual temple. Okay? Pretty simple. Now, if we were to have enough time, we could go starting in the 45th page of the fourth volume of the textbook to find out more detail and information about the 2300 days that are being spoken about in Daniel 8 and 14. Now this is where Dr. Kinley addresses this 2300 days. Now what's the heading that is there on page 45 of the fourth volume of the tabernacle, I mean of the textbook. The, clean, the cleansing of the sanctuary in the 2300 days of the prophecy. Now again, I threw out there that a could carnal mind would think it's some type of physical carnal sanctuary that has to be cleansed. And I pointed out what it was with the tabernacle and we pointed it out with the temple, correct? All right. Now, let's just catch, if you would, and this is where, as I said, Dr. Kinley is addressing it. I would like for you, if you would, go over to page 47, and right at the very paragraph above the bottom box, where it talks about Friday that Yahshua was crucified, or a death, or 1,000, and then the burial, 2,000, and his resurrection, 300th part of the day. You see that paragraph right above the box. Go ahead and read that, if you would. It must be remembered that the 2,300 days of the prophecy is a part of the 490-year period. Now, let's stop right there. Now, the previous speaker had dealt with this altar back here and showed that there was four 90 degree angles, correct? Or that there were 40, excuse me, 90 on each side of the altar. Or that's what, 
490. Now, to get that 490, we have to understand that the children of Israel had to have what they call the seventh day as a Sabbath. Correct? Now, and now on that day, they rested as Yahweh Elohim and Moses' vision rested on the seventh day or the Sabbath day. And when the law was spoken down, they were given six days they work, and the seventh day they have a Sabbath or a day of rest. Then further along, what it talks about is in Leviticus, you end up having seven times seven, which is what? Forty-nine years. And that's a year of a Sabbath. But in the 50th year, you had a year of Jubilee. And in those two years, the 49th and 50th, the children of Israel were not supposed to do any work or go and till their lands for food. Because on the 48th year, they were able to gather enough that would carry them through the 49th and the 50th year and into the 51st year when food started to grow for them. Does that make sense? All right. Then we read in the prophecy, and I would like for you to get this out of the Holy Name Bible, Daniel 9 and start at 25. Because what now we're discussing is the 490-year cycle that we must know and understand that those 2,300 days are a part of. Those 2,300 days are a part of the 490-year cycle, but we need to understand a little bit about a 490-year cycle. We're not going to be able to give all the proof and evidence. We'll give some so that you'll be able to go ahead and research more in the volume of the textbook because Dr. Kinley does address that information. Please, out of the holy name. Daniel 9.25, Holy Name Bible. Know therefore and understand that from the beginning going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem... Until now we have to stop there, because if you don't understand a little bit about the history of the children of Israel, then you're not going to understand about what's going to be said here. But the long and short of it is, at the end of Yahweh's 70 years of bondage of the children of Judah to Babylon... In there, Daniel was able to understand that 70 years of captivity that was spoken about by Jeremiah in 25 and 11. Well, what takes place is the children of Israel were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and build a temple. Then what takes place is an edict was given by Artaxerxes, which we will see over here on our Ages and Dispensations chart. This Artaxerxes, which is a Persian king, gave a commandment to say that the children of Israel can go back to Jerusalem and not build the temple because the temple was already built but to go back to Jerusalem and build the walls in the city of Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah. Well, what you have to understand is all of this is part of what is called a 490-year cycle. Now, to pick up a little bit about the situation is to anchor a point called the law given in 1490, BBY. 
And we can see that here on our chart is 1490 BBY when Moses is getting this vision and then also this tabernacle being built. That's an anchor point. That's an anchor point. Then if that's in 1490 and there's a 490 year cycle, so track 490 from 1490, then what do you get in number? That's pretty simple, a thousand. Well, that takes you from the tabernacle up to Solomon's temple when it was dedicated. Now, it took about seven and a half years to build Solomon's temple. And then it took another two and a half years to finally dedicate that temple. And the year that they dedicated it was in the year 1000, which takes you from the tabernacle, 1490 BBY, down to Solomon's temple, or 1,000. Now, we know that Solomon's temple stood for 33 years because you had Shishak the Egyptian come in and molest that temple and take stuff out of it. That's the molestation of it. All right? Now, that shows that Yahshua the Messiah, he was going to be on the earth, what? 33 years. Now, what takes place again is, this temple, eventually what takes place is, you end up having around 6,004 is when the children of Israel is being taken into bondage to Babylon. 604 taken into bondage into Babylon. So if you subtract 70 years from 604, that takes you down to 534. All right? Then it was not long after that, then that the Israelites were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Oh, why did they have to rebuild the temple? That means that Solomon's temple had been destroyed by the Persians. He destroyed it to such a point that they could not go in and offer sacrifices. The Babylonians, they couldn't go in. All right? They destroyed it. The Babylonians destroyed the temple. All right? So they had to build a new temple so that they could end up worshiping Yahweh. Now, what takes place now is this temple is built. And it's called, as we can see on this chart, Zerubbabel's Temple, which we say is dedicated in 510. Now, after a period of 53 years, this is when that Artaxerxes edict was given in 457. Now, we have Tabernacle, Solomon's Temple, Zerubbabel's Temple, 490 years from the law and tabernacle to Solomon's temple, then another 490 years from Solomon's temple to Jerubbabel's temple. Now what takes place then, once that, artic, that edict is given, now the clock starts ticking. And how many years is it going to tick, reader? And 9 and 25 out of the holy name. 9 and 25. Know therefore and understand that from, the be that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Restore and build Jerusalem. Unto the Messiah. Unto the Messiah. And who is this Messiah? It's not Cyrus. And Yahweh called Cyrus in the 44th, 45th chapter of Isaiah his anointed. Well, it's not this Cyrus. And Cyrus was a Persian, or a Mede, whichever it is. It's not him. It's called the Messiah who? Yahshua. Continue. The prince shall be seven weeks. Seven weeks. And three score and two weeks. Now, something's not reading right. But Continue. Continue. I want to hear 70 weeks of years. Oh, and shall, and the, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Continue. 
And after three score in two weeks. I think we're missing something. Oh, okay, 24. Okay, that's what we need. I want to get the 70 weeks of years to help you to understand that it's 70 weeks of years, and a week is how many days? Seven. Seven. That's why we're getting 70 times seven to get to 490. I already brought you up to the year of 49 and the year of Jubilee. But now we need to go and further and understand is 70 weeks of years. Does that what it's read in the Holy Name Bible? Yep. Nine That's what I need. 9 and 24. 70 weeks of years are determined upon thy people. Thank you. And upon thy holy city to restrain transgression and to make an end of sin offerings and to make atonement for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to complete the prophetic vision and to anoint the holy place. Now, how many conditions are right there, reader? Can you count them for us? And name them as you read them. Um, the end of sin offering, is that one? All right. We are already said that the children of Israel, when in that tabernacle, had to offer what? Sin offering. Right? Yep. Well, what and who was going to be the end of that sin offering? Yeah, sure. This is Joshua. That has to be the end of that sin offering. That's what we need to know and understand. Continue. The next one. To make a second. First, second. Name them as you go, please. Finish the transgression. Okay. First is to finish the transgression. Now, Number one. wasn't there a transgression back here with Adam? Right? That's the sin that people fell under was the sin or the transgression of Adam. Later on, that law was given to point out that sin and make it more exceedingly abundant to show the people that, look, they could not get themselves out of bondage or get themselves out from underneath sin, they needed to have a Savior, and that Savior was who? Yahshua the Messiah. So first was finished the transgression. Continue. Two, to make an end of sin offering. So this is that end of sin offering. Continue. Three, to make atonement for iniquity. Now the only one who can make atonement was Yahshua to make it what read it one more time and to make atonement for iniquity 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 means what not equal and we call the one who is iniquitous who mystery of iniquity mystery of iniquity all right continue four and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, you know what? While under this law, didn't they have to do this day by day, yearly, continually? And wasn't there always a remembrance of sin every time that they had to do whatever was contained in this law back here? Well, who was that that could end up making an end of it? That's Joshua. Read that again, please. And to bring... In everlasting righteousness. So there was no everlasting righteousness on this side of the cross. It's only after and through Yahshua's purposeful death, his purposeful burial, his purposeful resurrection, and purposeful outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we could now have everlasting righteousness because he is, I would say, the standard of righteousness. Would that be right or incorrect? In All right, continue. Five, and to complete the prophetic vision. Now, he is the completion. He is the end. He is the fulfillment of that prophetic vision and prophecy that is being prophesied by Daniel. Continue. Six, and to anoint the holy place. Now, again, a carnal-minded man would think that there's something within at this time of Yahshua in the Herodian temple that needed to be anointed. 
Well, that Herodian temple just didn't satisfy the requirements that we just read here in Daniel. The only one is this one, Yahshua the Messiah. Anything else there? That's the end of that. Now, we have to go back to the textbook down at the bottom of page 43, if you would, please. Is this kind of following together? Is it flowing? Are you beginning to understand and see the picture of what's taking place? Please, if you would. Bottom of page 47, it must be remembered. 47, it must be remembered that the 2300 days of the prophecy is a part of the 490 year period. So that 2300 days that we're talking about is part of those 490 year cycle. That's why we have to remember. It's part of. And remember, we ended with the 490 year cycle with this one, Yahshua the Messiah. This is who we ended up with. Correct? Continue. Figured from the commandment going forth under Artaxerxes from the body of the Messiah. Say that again. For the body of Yahshua the Messiah. The res it is the temple of the sanctuary of Yahweh that necessitated cleansing. Now, you understand that that temple is not a carnal, natural, physical temple that needed to be cleansed, but it is the body of Yahshua Messiah who is the temple of Yahweh. That's the sanctuary or temple that needed to be cleansed. Continue. After being made sin for us. And don't we say that Yahshua took the whole sin of the world upon himself? Didn't Yahshua come in the likeness of righteous flesh or sinful flesh? Sinful, sinful flesh. All right, continue. The resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, Elohim, was very early in the morning or Sunday or the 300th part of that 1,000-year day with Yahweh. Now, Yahshua came up early on the 300th part of the day. And remember, when Adam fell, that's when Yahshua picked him up. It's the same thing as when the people asked Yahshua for signs he said there will be no sign but the sign of Jonah. Jonah, and that being what? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. earth, right? Well, you have to know a little bit about the story of Jonah to be able to understand the correlation with what Yahshua was saying. And what you have is this one Jonah was asked by Yahweh to go to Nineveh and tell the people, here's Nineveh, to tell the people, hey, you better, you better straighten up for Yahweh's sake. I'll just put it that way. Well, Jonah didn't want to do it, so he got a boat out of right here, Joppa, and he started going west, which is in diametrically opposed direction of the direction he had to do. All right? And what you have to know and understand again is a tempest came along and belted that ship around to the point where the seamen, who are seaworthy, had to jettison out the goods that they were going to make money from, and they drew lots to find out, well, why is this all happening, and who did the lot draw on? It was Jonah. And Jonah said, look, you know what? Yahweh, I, I, I disobeyed him. And if you want this to be calm, then what you do is you throw me overboard. Well, the people were very 
reluctant to do that because they did not want to have the blood of Jonah upon their head. But you know what? They threw Jonah overboard, and Yahweh had prepared that specially prepared fish. Jonah didn't go down into the water and start sinking, and the fish scooped him up. As Jonah was cast over, death, hell, and the grave came up and met him at his coming. And that's as Yahshua the Messiah, he caught Adam, Jonah was caught. All right? And there's plenty more to deal with Jonah and then this one who is called Simon Bar-Jonah. That's what Yahshua called Peter, was Simon Bar-Jonah. But that's another whole story that we can get into another day. All right? Now, when we go into the textbook again, why don't you go ahead and go down to page 48 and get down there to around the next to the end, end paragraph until 2,300 days. Now, in this textbook, Dr. Kinley, he goes ahead and he gives some examples of the 2,300 days. First of all, he does the days of creation. You have a one, two, three, or 1,000, 2,000, the early part of the third day, the seed of vegetation, what? Came up. Or that's a what? A death, a burial, and a resurrection. Then you also then have from the fourth, fifth, and sixth day, and that's again a death, a burial, and who resurrected on the third day? Yeah. That's Adam. Adam was brought forth, wasn't he? Oh, wonderful. And Adam, Adam was brought forth. Right. Now, what takes place then is Dr. Kennedy goes and shows down here in the land of Egypt that same death, burial, and resurrection principle or a 2,300-day principle down here with the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Then Dr. Kennedy shows proof with Jonah that we just talked about and that was the sign that Yahshua said to the people, there will be no sign but the sign of Jonah, which is what? The three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, this is a great mystery. It's a great mystery. And the previous speaker, when he talked about what Yahweh called light, he called day, and that which he called dark, he called what? Night. And the previous speaker talked about what is called a phenomenal day. So the reason carnal theologians cannot understand it is because of exactly that. They think of a carnal natural sanctuary that has to be cleansed, and they think then the other about Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection. They have him resurrected a physical body. He raised a spiritual body. So there's so much more. Now, go ahead and read down there at the bottom of page 48. Page 48. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, you should know, if anything, of what has been talked about here in the last bit of time is that sanctuary that must be cleansed is not a carnal, natural, physical sanctuary in the earth plane. That is really talking about what? This sanctuary or the temple or the body of who? Yahshua. That's what it's talking about. So start thinking carnally, naturally, and physically. Think spiritually. Continue. Daniel 8 and 14. And that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years. And the previous speaker talked about that. So that Friday is as what? One day. And people, again, being carnally minded, can't get 72 hours from Friday unto Sunday. They just can't do it. So they manipulate the calendar and they start on Thursday or Wednesday or whatever other day that comes up in their theories, opinions, and imaginations to be, get some type of 72 literal hours <laughs> that he resurrected. Well, see, again, 
if you understood Yahweh's time frame and that what he called day, a light he called day, and what he called night he called darkness, or darkness and night, then you'd understand a little bit more about it. But continue. And uh, a thousand years is one day. Psalms 90 and 4, 2 Peter 3 and 8. And again, we have those right up here on this transgression in this court roundabout plate. Continue. As compared and applied elsewhere in the scriptures, pointing to the Messiah, Adam, the creation, the Israelites, Jonah, and the reconfirm, and reconfirmed by Peter's imprisonment and release in A.D. 43, or 10 years to the date after the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, Acts that is plate 35 on our 40 plate chart. Now, if you understand a little bit about the carnal, natural, physical Roman Catholic Church, you would have them having had Peter be two years Pope in A.D. 41. Well, where was Peter in AD 41, but up on the roof of a housetop, receiving a vision of that sheep being let down, and Yahweh saying to him, slay Peter and eat. And Peter said, no, master, I have never had anything clean go past these lips. And Yahshua, and they showed him three times, and he, it was said to him, what I have made clean, don't you call what? unclean, and about that time, men sent from Joppa, remember Joppa, went down to Caesarea, and that's where Philip ended up with Caesarea. You remember Philip? He's the one that baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, right? So there's a story behind that, but the long and short of it is people arrived at Caesarea, and they got Peter, and they took him back to Says, uh, jo uh, he went to Joppa and got Peter and brought him back to Caesarea. And that's when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit of promise. Right? So that's AD 41. So I guess what took place, as soon as that event took place, Peter must have got on a ship and sailed all the way from here to Rome to be coronated as the first papa. Then, see, we just read in the textbook about the re re resurrection reconfirmed, which took place what? In AD 43, didn't we? Didn't we? That's what we just read. Well, they still have Peter Pope. So Peter must have taken a leave of absence or something and went back to Jerusalem, and he got himself thrown into jail. And what kind of pope is that? Time's almost up. See, there's a lot to tell in this story, and we don't have time to tell it all, but we're trying to show that, look, what I'm going through is nothing more than what is in here in the textbook. Can anybody else really go through it? Yes, if you have the heart and mind, to be, it be given to you to go through. Because it's right here. But the long and short of it, if anything you can take away, that that sanctuary that's being talked about at the 2300 days is the body or sanctuary or temple of the body of Yahshua Messiah. If you can understand that, you're far above any carnal, natural, physical man or theologian that's been trained in the cemetery that's out there in the world. So hopefully something was said that has been edifying to the body of Yahshua the Messiah.
All right, there we go. Sorry for the delay. That brings it close to our class for today. Are there any comments or questions? Indeed, our class announcements are as follows. Classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7, thanks, 7 to 9 p.m. and Sundays 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. All beginner and instructional meetings are posted on the whiteboard in the back this coming Sunday, one week from today, is our third fundamentals class for the month of August. appreciated for either one please see our treasurer from the office of public relations you can now find our classes on Ustream, YouTube Facebook and Twitter and you can also find us at our website lansingbible.weebly.com all direct donations for the Ustream project are greatly appreciated this is a spiritual operation so Fifty one through fifty five is the scripture with that. And the Albuquerque branch is also having its spiritual feast three on November seventh through the ninth. No registration is due for that. Doxology. I will be quoting the last two verses of the book of Jude from the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. You can see it in a flower as it reaches for the sky. Every ocean praises Yahweh in overwhelming signs. So let's sing, Hallelujah. Let's sing, Hallelujah. Let's sing, Hallelujah. Let's sing. Let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing. His creation is a masterpiece no artist could touch, oh no, no. Every color that he painted, he painted it with love. Signature is seen on everything he made. Even you, for every breath you breathe, you breathe his living name. So let's sing, Hallelujah! Let's sing, Hallelujah! Let's sing, Hallelujah! 